So this is the final sermon in our foundation series. So when we wrap this one up today, if you've been here or you've listened to all of them, you can walk away saying you are fully equipped and you know everything you need to know for the rest of your life as a Christian because Joe and I have done such an excellent job in teaching all of this information. No, but seriously, um, it has been a challenging series for us, but it's been very edifying for us, I think, uh, both as preachers and as a church. There's just a, lot of, uh, there's just a lot of things that are important for us to know as believers. It, there's just so much depth in, in, in God's word and so many things that he desires for us to know about him and, and, and all of these things that he's given us by his grace to be able to worship him and live according to um, his plan for us. And so it can, be, it can be overwhelming at times when you try to dig into it. I know we've only scratched the surface in so many ways because, you know, trying to devote 30 or even 45 minutes or if it's me, maybe pushing an hour sometimes on, on one of these topics just isn't, isn't enough time. So, but we, we uh, hope that it's been edifying for you. Today, I want to close our time together by talking about one more very important topic for us, maybe in some ways, um, not the most important, but I think the most practical for us. So today, I want us to talk about what does it mean to follow Jesus. And so when I originally uh, had this sermon on the, uh, on the docket, on the plan, my idea or our idea was to talk about spiritual disciplines. And then as I started to prepare this sermon and I started to, to think about that, this sermon and kind of lay it out and work on it, the more and more I was working on it, the more and more it started to, to transform into something a little bit different than I originally planned. You see, I think if I was to just preach a sermon about spiritual disciplines, right, like, like, like about why we should read our Bibles more or why we should pray more, I don't think any of that stuff would be uh, overly earth-shattering to us, right? I think we all know we should read our Bibles more, we should pray more, it's important. I think we know all those things. But what I really want to get to, what I really want to get underneath all of that is, is why. Why should we do all of those things, right? It's all about following Jesus. It's all about loving him and serving him and, and, and following after him and pursuing Christ-likeness. Those are the things that are really most important. So we're going to talk a little bit about spiritual disciplines today, but really I want to talk to us about what does it mean to follow Jesus? I really want to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this series. You know, what, what does it mean to live the Christian life, and, and how do we do these things, and what does it look like? And it's really where the rubber starts to meet the road in this series, isn't it? You know, I think that's such, a, such an interesting phrase. We use it all the time, and if you really think about it, it really does apply. It's a good analogy, isn't it? Like, if I had the, the most powerful sports car, or, or, or like a dragster or something, right? It's got this huge engine in it. If you've ever looked at or been up close to one of those, like, drag cars, I mean, the engines on those things are massive. It's huge. It generates so much power, right? It's this massive engine, and it's got all this power built up into it. But if I was to take that car, and I was just to lift it up off the ground, just an inch, just so that the tires could no longer touch it, and you rev that engine with all of its might and spun those wheels as fast as you could, if they don't touch the ground, nothing's going to happen, right? It requires the, the tires to come into contact with the surface to transfer all of that power into motion for something to actually happen, right? So this is really where the rubber meets the road for this series. We want to make something happen. We want to see something happen. See, in many ways, I think today's sermon is about applying all the truths that we've talked about throughout this foundation series. How do we take all of the things that we've learned and how do we apply them to our lives? Why is it important for us to know God rightly, right? Why is it important for us to understand the authority of the, of the scriptures in our lives? Why is it important for us to understand about heaven or hell or sin or, or angels or, or all of these different things we talked about? Why do we spend time preaching the gospel? Why do we gather together as a church? All of these things that we talked about throughout this series why do we do all these things? At the end of the day, it's ultimately about following after Jesus. It's pursuing Jesus. Why did he have to come in the flesh? Why did he have to live and die for our sins? Why are these things important? It's all about following Jesus. See, we've covered a ton of ground in this series, and I think in many ways we've only begun to dip our toes in the water you know, hopefully you've come through this sermon and you know more than you did when we, or this sermon series, and you know more than you did when we started. 
But if we only acquire knowledge and we don't apply that knowledge, is there any benefit for us? Like, think about some of the greatest minds in the history of, our, of, our, of humanity, right? These, these people that, that have great intellects, they have all this knowledge. But what would, where would we be as a society if they never applied any of that knowledge, right? What if they hadn't used all of that knowledge that they have acquired to invent and create things and develop things and all the advancements that we enjoy as a society? What good is it for us, for a doctor, to go and spend years and years acquiring all this knowledge in medical school if he never practices medicine? Or a lawyer spending all this time learning about the law if he never practices law? What good is it if we just acquire knowledge but we don't apply it? The rubber has to meet the road. My point is simply this. The, the point of this series has not been simply to educate you on more and more points of doctrine. Right? The goal of this series has been to provide knowledge for you so that you can apply that knowledge in your life. Right? So that you can understand why all of these things are important and that they can bear fruit in your life. The knowledge, has to, the knowledge of truth has to lead to something. It has to have an impact. And I think that perhaps the best place for us to spend our time in the Word today is going to be in Romans chapter 12. I'd love to be able to preach through the entire chapter of Romans 12, but we don't have time. But there's just so much meat on the bones here, so it's a great place for you to, if you're looking for a place to just dig in at some point and study God's word, Romans chapter 12 is a great place because it talks a lot about how we apply the truth to our lives. So I'm going to read, we're just going to cover the first two verses today. So just two verses. I'm going to read them for us, and then we'll dig into it together. So Romans chapter 12 Starting in verse 1, Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So if you've been here for a while and you recall, the very first time I ever preached here at The Journey was my very first sermon ever. It was way back in 2015, and I preached out of the book of Romans. And I guarantee that nobody here, maybe my wife, maybe, remembers that sermon, but that's okay. I'm going to remind you of a couple things from that sermon. You see, when I preached that sermon, I said that I believe that the book of Romans is perhaps the most comprehensive or exhaustive Uh, presentation of the gospel anywhere in the scriptures. There's just a lot of meat on the bones in the book of Romans. There's a lot of truth for us to understand there, and it's just a very comprehensive and complete picture of the gospel that we see in the book of Romans. Throughout the book of Romans, Paul is, is presenting the truth and the reality of the gospel to us. It's also perhaps probably one of the most theologically robust books in the entire Bible, so there's just a lot of really important pieces of doctrine that we see presented and articulated very well throughout the book of Romans. So there's just a lot, like I said, there's a lot of meat on the bones when we talk about the book of Romans. In fact, you know, it's it's funny that a lot of seasoned preachers will will recommend to young preachers to, to not even think about attempting to preach through the book of Romans until they've got a lot of experience under their belts in um, expositing the scriptures and preaching sermons. You know, they just say, leave that until you've, you've grown up a little bit, little pup, right? So, you know, what did Cody do to me for my very first sermon? He gave me, he assigned me a text out of the book of Romans. So I, I thank you, Cody, for that one, right? But all joking aside, my point here is I'm bringing all this up because it's important for our conversation today. It's important for us to understand that Romans chapter 12 is drawing on all of those deep truths that, that um, preceded it in the, in the previous 11 chapters that we haven't covered but just it's important for you you to understand that. That Paul is talking here and he's basing everything that he talks about here in Romans chapter 12 on everything that he's he's, um, expounded on in the previous 11 chapters. And I know that because there's a very important word that we see right there in the beginning. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. See, anytime you see the word therefore in in, uh, in anything that you're reading, but particularly in the scriptures, You need to ask the question, what is it there for, right? And so Paul, that word, therefore, it always points 
to the cause of some effect, right? Like, I am hungry, therefore I ate. Or I am thirsty, therefore I drank, right? So when he says, therefore, and he begins to dive into these instructions here, he's saying, based on all of this important stuff that I've just been talking to you about, therefore, you need to do a couple of things. He's saying that in light of all of those truths, there's just a couple of things, which he lumps all of that together under that phrase, mercies of God, that we see there in chapter 1. But he's saying, based on all of that, there's therefore some things that you should do. There's actually two things that he says they should do. The first one is he says they should present themselves as holy and acceptable before God as an act of worship. And then the second thing that he tells them to do is they should seek to be transformed by the renewal of their minds so that they can discern God's will. So let me say right from the jump here that I think that we as a church culture in so many ways over the last 50 years or more have really started to, to kind of get this wrong. Right? When we think about all of these things, we've really kind of gotten a little bit off track. I think there's been this fundamental shift within the faith, for away from what Jesus in the Bible um, really says it means to follow after him. I think we've started to depart in many ways as Christians, subtly maybe, um, in, in small increments, but we've started to depart away um, from what Jesus in the Bible really says it means to follow after him. I think... We often live our lives in many ways in some state of confusion about what it means to follow Jesus. I don't think we oftentimes are really clear on what it means. And, and you know, I, I keep saying, you know, we, we may talk about the right things, right? So, like, if you listen to a lot of preaching, you may hear a lot of the right things. We may, as Christians, be very good at saying the right things. But I think oftentimes when it comes to applying these truths to our lives and the way that we live our lives, we've, we've departed away from what Jesus has really called us to. And I say we a lot. I keep saying we because I, I, you know, I think it's the overwhelming majority of the church falls in this camp, myself included. At times we can just, we can just get off track. We can replace um, what Jesus has called us to with, with some creations of our own. Right? Much like the, the Pharisees in Jesus' day, where they replaced really what God was calling them to with all of these rules and regulations and, and things that they put in place because they thought they were so holy, but really it was just drawing them farther and farther and farther away from God and what God had called them to. You see, I believe that at some point we transitioned away from, a faith, from our faith being formative to being performative. And what I mean there is that we've shifted away, uh, it's, we've shifted more to um, what, uh, what it means to be a Christian is more about what we do rather than who we are. And that's an important shift that's really um, had negative impacts on us a, as a community of faith, I think. And, uh, you know, I think that I can actually prove this to you if you bear with me a little bit here. I think I can actually prove it to you. So if you follow church culture at all, big, big C church, if you follow church culture at all, if you pay attention to things that are going on within the church, particularly here in, in America, um, what you will probably see is we have, there's this phenomenon that has happened um, with the celebrity pastor, right? We have pastors now who serve in many ways as uh, celebrities. They become like rock stars in, in, in many ways. And what happens time and time again we see not even just with the celebrity pastors, but, but in the pastorate in general, is we'll see people build up these massive ministries, right? They, they attract a following, they build up massive ministries, and then what happens inevitably over time? It all falls apart, doesn't it? It collapses under its own weight. Time and time again, we hear about these, these celebrity and even non-celebrity pastors who fall into um, sin struggles, that, that derails their ministry, that destroys their churches, that hurts people. Um, just all of these things we see time and time again. Like, if you pay attention to this, if I said to you, hey, think of some pastor or big ministry that fell apart because of some sin or abuse or, or pride or, you know, something, it wouldn't take you very long to think of one. One would probably almost immediately come to mind. And I, I think, you know, we have to ask the question, why? Like, why does this keep happening over and over and over again? These, these guys that, that seem to be um, saying the right things, that, you know, they, they're engaging, people are, are coming to them, 
people are, things are, good things are happening. I mean, God, let's not forget, God can use these things. Like, good things can happen within these ministries. But overall, there's just this rotten core to it, right, that starts to eat away, this disease that slowly kills it. I listen to this, I travel a lot for work. I listen to this podcast series about the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church. If you're familiar with Acts 29, which we're a part of, Mars Hill Church was Pastor Mark Driscoll, who was instrumental in founding Acts 29, had a massive ministry out in Seattle, um, and, and it just, it fell apart. Like, it just collapsed. And now, you know, listening through that podcast was just heartbreaking to hear the stories of how many people were hurt from just the abuse of this ministry and just his abuse of power and the ways that he wielded his power to hurt people and to, to do these. It's just, it's heartbreaking. But we hear this time and time and time again. And I don't, I don't want to like, you know, how does, how does this happen? How does someone build up this giant ministry and then how does it all just fall apart? And I don't want to like, I, like I said, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like God does amazing things even through some of these ministries when they're, when they're thriving, right? I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think we have enough evidence here to see that, that there's a real problem, right? And I think it's, it's more systemic than we probably want to admit. There's just a real problem uh, in the church here today, especially here in the U.S. You see, I think that we may have replaced being godly and being a, a man of, of Christ-like character with being engaging or dynamic or entrepreneurial, you know, uh, as the greatest qualifications for our leaders. And if that's the standard that we set for the men who are called to be the, the standard bearers in the church, right? If, they're, if that's the standard that we set for those who are called to lead and shepherd the flock, then how can we expect more from the sheep, right? right? If that's the standard that we set, how can we expect more from the sheep? So how do we reorient ourselves? How do we get back to basics? How do we get back to what the Bible really is calling us to, what Christ is really calling us to? You see, again, I think Paul tells us here, he reminds us of our calling to follow Christ in faith. We present ourselves, our bodies, as holy and acceptable before God as an act of worship, and we seek to be transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we can discern God's will. You see, it's interesting here that he uses the word bodies, isn't it? Like, oftentimes we would think about, like, presenting maybe our hearts or our spirits or our souls, right? We would, we, we would use that kind of language we are familiar with that kind of language. We would expect to see that kind of language. In the scriptures, when it talks about the heart or the spirit, it's talking about kind of the, the, the essence of who we are. It's really who we are at our core. It's what makes us up, right? I mean, our body is a, is a shell, but it's really who we are. You know, it's the, the heart is the center for who we are. It's where our will and our, and our spirit and everything just kind of, it's the essence of who we are. It's the, the center of us. And so we, we talk a lot about our heart, right? We typically talk that way about ourselves. We say, you know, Jesus has my heart, or I've given Jesus my heart, right? But what about our lives, right? We're content to give Jesus, say we've given Jesus our, our hearts, right? But what about our lives? Do we give him any dominion over our lives, right? So, we, so often we're comfortable with saying, oh, I've given Jesus my heart, but I keep my life for myself, right? Don't interfere in my day-to-day -day operations, Jesus. But you have my heart. You can have my heart. It's yours, right? We don't give him any dominion over our lives. But see, Paul doesn't mince words here. He says, present your bodies as an offering of worship. See, give him everything, right? Give him your whole life. Not just your heart, but everything. Your whole life. Surrender your will to Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus. Give him everything. Give him everything. My finances, yep. My family, yep. My time, yep. Everything, anything you can think of belongs to Jesus. Surrender it all to him. Present your bodies, right? Your body is the shell, but it's the, the part that's active, right? I live my life in my body. My body goes, it does. It's the active part of my life. Surrender your bodies as an act of worship. Again, this is where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? So what does this actually look like? How do we do this? What does it look like? See, now I just said that the problem was that our emphasis is so often, um, it's been too much on doing instead of being. And yet, 
I'm preaching a sermon here talking to us about practical ways that we can do this. And when we read uh, Paul's instructions here, he gives us, it, it is instructions, right? So there's instructions, there's commands to do things. See, we're looking here at Romans and Paul is telling us to do some things. And I'm telling you that I'm going to tell you to do some things. So there seems to be a lot of expectation for doing here, right? And I'll say that's true. It is true. Throughout the scriptures, there are so many commands. We are expected to do a lot of things. God has given us commands, not just to give them to us, because, but rather because he actually expects us to do them. But I think the key to understanding this is really to think about who is primarily, and I want to emphasize the word primarily here, who is primarily active here? Who's primarily at work in our doing? See, I've got a lot of irons in the fire right now, so let me just, I, I want to just refocus us real quick. I want to quickly kind of take, call a timeout and bring our focus back onto what I'm trying to get at here. So this all makes sense. See, my contention so far has been that I fear we may have gotten off track a bit in how we think about what it means to follow Christ. And what it actually means to be a Christian. And why God, God tells us it means, according to his word, is that we are being renewed. We're being made new, day by day by day. Oftentimes we use the big, fancy Christian word sanctification when we talk about this process of being renewed day by day. It, it, it's this word sanctification, or, or to be sanctified, or to sanctify, that we often talk about. So this is the goal, or this is the point of it all, right? This renewal. And the point of our faith, the point of why we gather as a church, the point of why we preach the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. It's the point of all of this is this bit renewal, to be transformed into Christ's likeness day by day. That's what the Christian, is, Christian life is all about, to be transformed into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that our lives day by day look more and more and more like what we see in the scriptures, Jesus' life looking like that's what paul is telling us here in romans 12 but this teaching isn't novel to paul we actually find it all over the scriptures and i think one place where we can really see it straight from the horse's mouth is in john chapter 15 where we see jesus teach this directly himself so let's turn over to john chapter 15 and i want to look at the first 11 verses there i'll read it to us in John chapter 15, this is Jesus talking. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your, your joy may be full. See, there's this great mystery, I think, that underlies the Christian faith. This great mystery that kind of underlies the entirety of human existence, really. It's this great mystery that we see, and I think nowhere it's more evident than, than perhaps in the Christian life. You see, for starters, we know, if we recall back to our very first sermon in this series, we talked about who God is, and one of the things we emphasized in that is that God is absolutely and totally sovereign, right? So God could not be God if he were not totally and fully and completely sovereign. If anything else in the universe was free from the sovereignty of God, that thing would cease to be under God, which would mean it's over God, which would mean it's God. So it makes sense, right, if we think about it logically, that God has to be completely and totally sovereign. There can be nothing that exists outside of his sovereignty. Everything that, uh, that is, 
that has been or will ever be exists under the sovereignty of God. It only is because it is according to the good and perfect will of God. See, we talked about this when we started the series. It's absolutely foundational to our understanding of who God is. We have to start with God's sovereignty because his sovereignty gives him the authority over his creation. He has authority over all things because he is sovereign over all things. And everything that happens in this world, in our lifetimes, in the lifetimes that have been or will be, happens according to the good and perfect will of God. And we have to emphasize that good and perfect portion because the problem with God's sovereignty, the stumbling block that we as human beings run into time and time again is we just can't wrap our minds around it because we look at the world around us and we see the problem of evil and we see the problem of sin and we see the problem of death and we see all of the problems, right? And it's kind of like being in a dense forest and we just can't see past all of the trees that are blocking our view. But see, God has that, that 10,000 foot view that we can never have or understand that he sees how all of these things work together and how he's working even through our sin and even through the evil in the world to accomplish his good and perfect will and all of those things ultimately go to glorify him for his glory and for our good and it can be really hard to understand that particularly when we're in the midst of a difficult time right to really wrap our minds around that that can be a hard pill to swallow but it's foundational it's where we have to start so when we articulate the Christian faith, we start with the reality that our salvation and everything that follows is not a result of anything that we do, but rather it is a result of the finished work of Christ according to God's perfect will, right? That, that everything that unfolded, even the evil of the cross, happened according to God's will. And the fact that we are, are able to be saved by faith, through grace, in Christ, is, is all happens according to God's will. Jesus says it right here in John 5, uh, chapter 15. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. All right? So that means I can't will myself into salvation. I can't will myself to clean up my life and make myself presentable to God. Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. See, Christ paid the debt we could not pay for our sins on our behalf upon the cross. And the righteousness in which we now stand is an alien righteousness. It lies outside of ourselves. It does not belong to us. Rather, it is imputed to us or given to us as a gift by Christ. We have inherited his righteousness so that when we stand before God, he doesn't see us and our sin-soaked, ugly, messy selves. But rather, he sees the perfection of his son whom he loves and in whom he is well pleased. We have received this gift through faith, and it rests in the finished work of Christ. And we emphasize that reality week in and week out here at The Journey. We try to at least, hopefully you've picked up on that, that ebb and flow in our ministry. We try to emphasize that time and time again. We're trying to, to change the direction, right? We're trying to get away from this idea of that I need to do it, and that I can do it. And if I just tighten up my bootstraps enough, you know, and I really put my put my, my effort into it, that I can do it all by myself. But we can't do it. We never could, we never will be able to, we cannot accomplish it on our own. It all depends on Christ, on Jesus. And yet, when I look through the scriptures time and time again, like I mentioned, I see all of these commandments, right? Jesus gives us commandments, the apostles give us commandments, God gives us commandments in the Old Testament through his prophets, right? There's it's chock full. There's a lot of pages here. And it's chock full of commandments. All of these things that we are called to do. I see these instructions time and time again. For ways that we are supposed to live in light of our calling. As, as adopted sons and daughters of the king. There's all of these instructions for how we are to live our lives. So there's clearly an expectation that our faith would be active, right? That it wouldn't just be... Um, this, this thing that, that, we, that we point to, this abstract thing that we point to, like a, like a certificate on a wall, right? Like my diploma from, from college that hangs on the wall in my office. So I just point to it and say, see, I, I know stuff. I learned stuff. I'm smart, right? It doesn't work that way, right? Our faith is supposed to be active, right? We apply those realities. I took the things that I learned in college and I applied them to doing my job today. 
right? I apply so that there's some meaning or bearing to that certificate that hangs on my wall. In other words, we have lots of responsibilities and these responsibilities, they produce visible, tangible, real results in the world around us. This is the other half of that great mystery. That God is completely in control of all things and all things happen according to his will and yet we as human beings have responsibilities. We're responsible for our sins. We're responsible for our obedience. We have responsibilities in this world. It's a great, great mystery and this tension exists in the scriptures and God sees fit to just leave it exist there, right? He never explains to us uh, how this is really supposed to work. He just kind of leaves that tension there. We see time and time again that he is absolutely sovereign and we see time and time again that we are responsible beings. See, Jesus uses the word abide here to describe this mysterious relationship. When we see here in John chapter 15 the word abide over and over and over again, I think that's what the word abide is pointing to. It's pointing to this mysterious relationship between God's sovereignty and our responsibility. See, how do we abide in Christ? We'll see on the one hand, we abide in Christ by hoping and resting in him and his finished work through faith. We just simply believe. We place our trust in him. We place our faith in him and his work and his accomplishments. And we just simply believe. It's that easy. We place our hope and our trust and our faith and our belief in him and what he has done. That's one side of the coin. But on the other side, uh, we see elsewhere that time and time again, um, we, we have to come alongside him, that there's things that we should do. Let's look again at verses 3 through 5 in John chapter 15. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So he's talking here about our justification, right? That already we've been made clean by the promises of the gospel, which he has been teaching them about. That he's going to die, that he's going to take the punishment for their sins, and they'll be made clean just by faith and trust in what he's done. So already, uh, he says here, already you have been clean because of the word, been made clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we see it here, right? Explicitly called out by Jesus. That apart from him and his power and his spirit working in our lives and his will overriding our sinful will, right? Apart from that, we cannot do anything. Paul talks in Ephesians about us being dead, formerly dead in our trespasses. And we know that a dead body can't do a whole lot, right? A dead body just stays dead. Once we're dead, we, have, we can't do anything. A dead body doesn't do anything. It stays dead. So that is the reality that we see here, that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. We see it time and time again that Jesus, Jesus and his spirit working in us is the primary actor in our lives. All the, the good that comes from us, like if you see something good in me, you're not seeing Chris, you're seeing Jesus, right? Like you're seeing Jesus working in me and through me. You don't see Chris, you see Jesus. So when God looks at me one day, when I stand before him in judgment, I'm counting on the fact that he's not going to see Chris, he's going to see Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. And we see that the act of abiding isn't entirely passive, rather we actively abide. Look again in verses 8 through 10. He says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the way that we actively abide is by doing what Christ has commanded to us and what he has modeled for us in his life. See, we pursue Christ-likeness. It's an active pursuit. It's something that we do day in and day out, pursuing Christ-likeness, pursuing this, this renewal, pursuing this transformation, pursuing being remade day in and day out to look more and more and more like Jesus. See, we should be, it should be very obvious when we look at our lives and we look for the fruit of Christ-likeness, it should be very obvious to us because it should look so much different than the world around us. We are called as Christians to be 
uh, separate from the world, to be, to be different. That's what the word sanctified means. It means to be pu- pu- pulled apart or set apart for a purpose, right? We've talked about that when we talk about, uh, when I talked about holiness, when I've talked about holiness time and time again, that holiness, this pursuit of holiness, it's not just moral purity, rather, it's, it's holiness as, a, as an attribute of God is the essence of who God is. It's the things about God that set him apart from everything else. It, it, it's the things that make him other than. And we, as Christians, are called to pursue holiness. It says, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy, right? We're pursued to look different. We're, or we're called to look, pursue looking different from the world. So as we close our time together, let's turn back to our passage in Romans 12 and look again with fresh eyes. Let me read it for us one more time. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Holy, right? Different than, other than, set apart, which is your spiritual worship. This is how we worship God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, Paul gives us very practical instructions here, doesn't he? It's very simple, practical instructions. First, he says that our abiding begins by offering our lives to Christ in worship. We've already touched on this, right? But that we need to give him everything. That the the act of worship requires that we give him everything. Think about the parable of the rich young ruler, right, that came to Jesus. And he said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says to him, you have to keep all of the law and, and, and obey all the law and the prophets. And, and he says, oh, I've, good, I've done that, right? And then Jesus says, oh, very good. Well, then um, sell everything that you have, give it away, sell it, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And what happens? How does the rich young ruler respond to Jesus, right? He walks away heartbroken, right? Distressed because what Jesus has called him to is, is too much for him to bear, right? He was willing to give Jesus his heart, but he wasn't willing to give him his life. So he says that, Paul says that our abiding begins with this offering of our lives to Christ in worship. I think the most effective way that we can worship God is, is by submitting our lives to him. But the whole problem for us, the whole problem for humanity began in the garden with this whole idea of submitting our lives to God, right? So God gave instructions to Adam and Eve, but what happened? Adam and Eve didn't believe that God's instructions or that God, what God was offering to them was what was best. They believed that, that he wasn't good and rather that he was withholding something better from them, right? That there was something, because he had put restraints on what they could do. He had given them all of the garden, but he had put restraints. He had said, don't touch this tree. This is for me. This is not for you, right? And so in their minds, they said, well, God's not really good. He doesn't really want what's best for me. Rather, he's withholding something better from me, right? That he's got this little thing that he won't give to me and it's better for me if I have that thing. See, the root of all of our problems since the beginning of humanity is that we reject God's authority over us. We reject his sovereignty. We reject his authority. We we reject his will for our lives, and we pursue our own will. I can't help but think of it a little bit like my dog when I take him out for, or her, take her out for a walk on her leash. So we have, uh, we got a new dog. Uh, She's uh, almost a year old. She'll be a year old Next year, she was a stray, so she is a wild, untamed beast. And, uh, and so we have this dog, and when we take her out for walks, this dog, I mean, doesn't matter what kind of collar we put on her, she will pull to the point that she is like, uh, uh, like dying. I mean, you know, she's like, I mean, I'm like, this dog's going to die. We better get home quickly. I mean, she is pulling so hard on, and it doesn't matter. We've tried the, like, the little spiky thing that's supposed to, you know, they don't like that. It's, she doesn't care. She will pull and pull and pull. And I think about it a lot like, like that when I think about our lives, right? So, like, we pull and pull and pull on the leash. But the purpose of the leash, yes, the purpose of the leash is to restrain our dog when we go on a walk, but not because we have some ill will or because we want to see our dog sitting there panting for its life because it's choking itself to death. We are, not because we enjoy that 
Well, I kind of do a little. <laughs> this dog drives me crazy, so I'm kind of like, that's what you get, you stupid dog. Um, but no, in, in reality, that's not why we put the leash on, right? We put the leash on because it, it's, it's for the dog's safety and for the safety of others around, right? We don't want the dog to be able to run free where it could get hurt, where it could get away from us, where it could get outside of our, our control, right? We want what's best for the dog. Ideally, we would want the dog not to pull us, but rather to walk with us so that where we go, it goes as our companion, right? Doesn't that kind of really illustrate God's authority in our lives too, right? That he doesn't put these restrictions on us because he wants to, you know, it's like some, he's like mean and he just wants to yank on the leash so that we can't get away. Rather, he puts restrictions and, and boundaries on our lives because he wants what is best for us. As the creator, he alone knows how things should function best, how they function most properly. And so he gives us instructions and guidelines for how we should live our lives because then we can, we can flourish, we can, we can live according to his will, and we can, we can really um, enjoy our, our best life now, if I can coin that phrase. <laughs> See, the goal would be for, for our dog to learn to walk on the leash and to experience the joy of, of, of that walk alongside us in the same way that God intends to, to walk alongside us in lives. And so it is with us. We could enjoy life as God has designed it, but yet we time and time again decide that we want to pull on that leash. We want to tug. We want to we want to pull. And we want to kick against the goads. We want to pull. It doesn't matter how hard my dog pulls on that leash. That dog's not getting away, right? And it's the same way with us. It doesn't matter how hard we push against those boundaries and we kick against the goads and we pull upon the leash. We are not able to escape God's sovereign will for our lives. And we can just enjoy fellowship with him if we could just learn to stop pulling. Moreover, we don't just walk in obedience, but we surrender our lives fully and completely to Christ. Again, Paul points to the whole of us, our bodies. It's not enough to just surrender bits and pieces. Rather, we have to give him everything. We have to give it all over to Christ. So we can resist temptation to be conformed, not to Christ's likeness, but rather to the world, right? right? We, we, there's this temptation in us that we be conformed to look like the world. The world says, do this, do these things, come along, this is going to be fun. It makes all these promises it can't keep, but they sound so good, they're so tempting, right? So we're, we're, we're tempted time and time again not to be conformed to Christ's likeness, but rather to be conformed by the will that Paul says, no that we need to resist that temptation. And how do we do that? We do that by renewing our minds, renewing the way that we think, being given a new heart and a new mind to think differently from the world, to be able to see those lies for what they are, right? Empty promises that will never pay um, off the way that they promise to. And the way that we renew our minds is by regularly being reminded of what is true, by drinking from that well day in and day out, by enjoying fellowship and communion with God. See, as the branch is one with the vine, so too we must abide with Christ or in Christ by being one with him through daily communion. And I'm not I use the word communion, I'm not talking about communion like we're going to take here in a little bit. I'm talking about communion as in fellowship with God, right? Community with God, being in community with God, doing life with God. And we do this primarily by being faithful and diligent in two areas of our life, by prayer and by studying of God's word. Ouch. Right? Ouch. Anybody want to raise their hand and say, my prayer life or my scripture life is exactly where it should be right now? I don't either. Right? right. See, this, this fellowship with God, though, it, it can't just be an act of religion. Right? That's the problem. Uh, that was the problem in Jesus' time, right? That was the, the problem that he was constantly confronted with. Right, this idea of, of doing things simply for acts of religion. That's legalism, right? It's so often that's where we want to go with things. We want to stumble into legalism. We want to be legalistic. That was the problem with the Pharisees. It's the problem in our own hearts. It's the problem with our nature, right? That we want to we want to make it about us. We want to we, they were using the scriptures and the prayers to point to how pious they were. Right? How great and special they were rather than using them to glorify uh, God with their lives. Rather than glorifying God in, in prayer and in study of his word. 
See, God desires to meet with us in prayer and the word because he desires to commune with us and we should seek him above all things else because we desire the same, right? That we just desire to know him, that we desire to have fellowship with him, that we desire to be close to him. This doesn't mean that God won't honor time in his word or in prayer when we just aren't feeling it, right? I think oftentimes those are some of the most fruitful times. When we go there, not because, not because we're, we're feeling super high and mighty and holy and we just want to be like, yeah, I'm killing it today. I spent, you know, an hour in the word. I spent an hour praying and now I'm going back for more because I'm just super holy today, right? Like, like those days are, are great. That's a great thing to desire that and to just, just be overjoyed and, and on fire for the Lord. But I think even more so in the times when we don't desire, when we don't feel close, when we don't have that desire, but yet we pursue him. I think he's faithful in those times to draw us close and to really pay dividends on that investment of our time. But most importantly, we should be pursuing fellowship with God out of this abundance for love that we have for him in light of who he is and what he has done for us. We must be completely enamored with him, overwhelmed by his majesty. When we think about who God is, it should overwhelm our hearts and our minds and our spirits. I heard Pastor Paul Washer once say that he would be completely fine by telling people that they should joyfully give all of their worship to God, even if that he was still to send them straight to hell, right? Because he alone is worthy, right? But God doesn't send us to hell, right? He, 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 he doesn't send us to hell because of his grace and mercy that he has shown us in Christ. He's rescued us through his son. This is the icing upon the icing on the cake, right? That we get to, to see God for who he is, and that alone should inspire us to worship him and him alone with all of our beings, even with, it, with no benefit to us, just rather because we are enamored with who he is. But then the extra layer, the icing upon the icing upon the cake is that we get to, we don't get sent to hell, right? That we get to enjoy fellowship with him, that, that, that he makes us right with him through Christ, that we're able to be drawn into a right relationship with, with him. How much more so now do we have reason to worship in light of the cross, in light of what God has done for us through Christ? So often, if we're honest, we just lack the motivation to pursue God, don't we? Like if we're being really honest about our, our motivation and our hearts, we just lack the motivation to pursue this relationship or this communion and worship with God and prayer and the word. We don't pr prioritize it in our lives like we should. We're often guilty of putting secondary things above it, distractions get in the way time and time again. How can this be, right? Like when you think about it, like how can this be? How can we allow these things to get in the way and yet time and time again we do? And then we wonder why we don't see the fruit of his presence in our lives. We wonder why we don't see um, him at work in our lives in the ways that we think we, he should be. And we think, well, he's abandoned us, right? Like he doesn't really love us, like he's abandoned us. But no, we've abandoned him. We've abandoned him. Hours upon hours upon hours in work and play, but no time in our busy schedule for God. Is this what he's really intended for us, church? Is this what he really intends for his people? For us to spend our lives pursuing all these other pleasures and joys and not to pursue him? So let me be really transparent here because I don't want to be guilty of being a hypocrite. Like this sermon was convicting to me. So often I allow the distractions in. So often I fail to lead my family well. I am uh, the chief of sinners. So you're not alone. Like if, it's, if it's hard for me, you know, and, I, and if it's hard for me, uh, who's been, been called, I believe, by God and trusted with this flock as part of the, the, the leaders here at the church, if it's hard for me, then, then I, I understand why it's hard for you. It's hard for us. We get distracted. Sorry, guys. This was a hard one. See, I've been guilty 
of making time for so many lesser things in my life and not being, um, uh, not being, being obedient to God, not pursuing him in the ways I should, not pursuing to lead my family well, not pursuing to love my, life, my wife well by praying with her, reading the word. I've been guilty and it's convicting. It hurts. Like when we come face to face with that reality, it hurts. Like it really hurts. Writing this sermon has been a great source of sorrow for me. But I thought it was important. Like I could have preached the easier sermon. Like I could have preached the easier sermon, but when I dug into it, that wasn't where God led me. I think he was trying to do work in my life and I hopefully he's trying to do work in your life too. See, it's reminded me of my deep need for repentance and all of the transformative work that still remains in my life. The process of sanctification can be a long and painful process. But God's grace is sufficient for us, even in our weakness. When I am faithless to live up to my responsibilities, he is still faithful to keep his promises. Don't lose sight of that. Right? Even in our faithlessness, God is faithful. Therefore, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So like I said, I could have written the sermon that I originally intended to write today. And I could have talked about how we should read our Bibles more and we should pray more. And those are true, and it's important for us to do that. And I pray that we would, that we would have a desire to pursue God in those areas because it's so important for our lives. But if we're just doing it because it's some senseless, mindless act of worship, right? That we're just doing it because we feel like when we do that, then we can put God in our debt, that we can, we can make him, you know, we can kind of, we can switch the roles, right? We can put the leash on him. Like, I got you now, God. I've been reading my Bible this week. You owe me, right? If we're doing it for those reasons, then we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Don't do it at all. Get another hobby. Like, do something else. Because you're not, it's not, there's no benefit in that. We need to pursue God, not out of legalism, but out of a joy and a love for him. Over and above those other things in our lives. Those distractions that get in the way. Should we pray more and read our Bibles? Absolutely, for a myriad of important reasons. But above all else, as we draw, clo draw to a close in this foundation series, I hope that the knowledge that we've gained, that we don't just simply have more knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but that we apply it. That, that as we learn about these deep truths from the scriptures, that we see God in his fullness, that we draw closer to him, that we desire him above all else. And then it bears the fruit, right? Then we abide in him, in fellowship, in communion, through study of his word, through prayer, through gathering together at, at corporately to worship him. All of these things that we do, that there's a meaning and a purpose and a reason behind them. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the work that you uh, are doing in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing in my life. Lord, I just pray for your forgiveness for all the times when which I have failed to be faithful, when I have been faithless and yet you continue to be faithful and, and, and that I don't have to put my hope and my trust in my ability to remain faithful, but rather I can put my hope and my trust and rest in the fact that you never fail, that you are always faithful. That even in, in light of, of our shortcomings and our failures and our rejection and, and, and our proclivity to run from you, to flee from you, to run after other shiny, distracting things, Lord, that you still love us, that you still draw us close, that you still, while you might extend the range on our leash, Lord, that you refuse to let us go and that you promise us in your word that that you will not lose even one of us, Lord, that yet you will be faithful to complete the work that you have started in our lives. Lord, can we rest in that? Can we just find our hope and our joy in that? And in that, Lord, can we find a deep desire for you, a, a love for you, a love that, that just fuels everything else in our lives. It fuels our, our, the way that we think about everything in our lives, the way that we live with the, the things that you've given to us, that we live generously, that we live um, open-handedly, Lord, that we just trust our lives to you. That we're not content to just say we've given you our hearts, but rather that we would give you our whole lives. Lord, I pray that you would bless and honor the time that we spent 
in this series together, trying to, to, to understand all of the, these truths about you. And Lord, I pray that you can be at work even through the shortcomings of, of, of my preaching skill, Lord, and, and my ability to, to teach your word, Lord, but even through that, that you can be at work. We just thank you for your goodness to us. We ask these things most beautiful.